it's perhaps my favorite duty as a, the conference director to introduce this particular lecture because it honors the memory of uh, my friend and mentor, Murray Rothbard. He was an intellectual giant who brought Austrian economics into the post-war war era. Uh, his great treat, uh, in his great treatise, Man, Economy, and State, um, we have today someone who is one of the people responsible for carrying forward Murray Rothbard's legacy in Italy. Professor Modugno is a history of a historian of political thought at the University of Roma, Trey. She is the author of a major study of Rothbard as a philosopher and many books in Italian on liberal philosophy, including a detailed assessment of the viability of anarchist political orders. Her collection of unpublished essays by Rothbard on major philosophers is coming out from the Mises Institute in 2009. She will discuss Rothbard's social philosophy by comparing him with other major thinkers. Welcome, Professor Madugno. Thank you. In the last several years, I have been working on a set of Rothbard's papers. As a result, thanks to the Mises Institute, they have been published first in Italy, and now, for the first time, they will be available in English uh, in the volume Rothbard versus the Philosophers, published by the Mises Institute. The papers uh, um, clarify the author's position in relation to intellectuals such as Leo Strauss and Karl Polanyi on, on topics uh, such as uh, uh, progress, technology, and on what today is termed globalization. Others, such as the two sets of comments on Hayek's Constitution of Liberty, contain not only the criticism of the Hayekian concept of coercion later found in the ethics of liberty, but also some very interesting criticism of the rule of law as a guarantee of, of liberty and of the absence of references to natural law in Hayek's work. Rothbard's criticism of Hayek's and Mises' ideas dates back to 1958 and 1960, respectively. And it is actually here that for the first time, Rothbard is extensively expresses dissent on some of the ideas of the two great masters. The comments on the Symposium on Relativism of, of 1960 mark the first time that Rothbard distanced himself from some musician positions. This is a very interesting set of documents showing how the main line of Robardian thought were already firmly in place between the late 1950s and the early 1960s as regards subjects such as the possibility of absolute ethical values based on natural law, the non-aggression action, and the criticism of the state. As early as 1948, we find comments made by the 22 years old Rothbard on Cotton's paper, Rugged Individualism, in which, as a result of his methodological individualism that was already mature before he met Mises, the young author was able to demolish the aberrant theories of social Darwinism allusions to the immorality of the state initiatives for social welfare and criticism of the state were a sign that the development of Rothbard's thought already included the idea of the state as aggressor. One of the basic themes of Rothbard's writings presented here is the possibility of rationally founding ethical value, and the constant preference to natural law 
and natural rights. Rothbard was always very critical of Leo Strauss, but he agreed with him on the need for a rational basis for ethics and absolute values. According to Rothbard, the great virtue of Strauss' work is that he wants to restore values and political ethics to the study of politics. However, Rothbard, Strauss, that Strauss' work also contained a great defect. Quote, the great defect is that Strauss, while favoring what he considers to be the classical and Christian concept of natural law, is bitterly opposed to the 17th and 18th century conception of luck and the rationalist, particularly to their abstract deductive championing of the natural rights of, of individual liberty, liberty, property, and so on. Strauss, in fact, has been the leading champion, along with Russell Kirk and the Catholic scholars in America, of a recent trend in luck historiography to sunder completely the bad individualistic natural rights type of natural law of the 17th and 18th centuries from the good classical Christian type. Good, presumably because it was so vague and so prudential that it offered very little chance to defend individual liberty against the state. In this reading, Hobbes and Locke are the great villains in the alleged perversion of natural law. To my mind, this perversion was a healthy sharpening and development of the concept. My quarrel with Strauss and Kirk, therefore, is not only valuational, that they are anti-natural rights and liberty, and they am for them, but also factual and historical, for they think that the Lockeans had an entirely different concept of natural law whereas I think that the different was a sharpening development rather than a perversion or a diametric opposite. This was where uh, Rothbard criticism of the Straussian concept of modern natural rights first appeared, a theme uh, he um, later took up elsewhere. <coughs> Strauss argued that modern natural rights were a degeneration of classic natural law that was an expression of civic virtue. In Strauss' view, the individualism of the Lockean tradition with its theory of property broke with, with the classical and scholastic tradition and represented a decline from the values of the past placing the individual and his rights at the center of the universe, with consequences such as the solution of political problem through economic means, of which he disapproved. Rothbard saw Strauss as an icon of conservatism, pressing an invitation to return to the ancient and the critic of modernity. But at the same time, by claiming not only the possibility, but also the right to pass value judgments, Strauss was railing against value-free modern political science and relativism. In both what is political philosophy and in thoughts on Machiavelli, Strauss criticizes modern thinkers and defends classic political philosophy. And so, for Strauss, Machiavelli became the evil genius of modernity, having challenged the ancient Christian teachings and having freed political reality from morality. Rothbard, on his side, doesn't agree with Strauss' attack on, Mia on Machiavelli, not for being an ethical, but for being an atheist and a humanist. By contrast, Rothbard's appreciation of Machiavelli is based exactly on what Strauss condemns in Machiavelli's thought. 
quote, that Machiavelli is pro-selfishness of the individual against the older concern of the common good, that he is in favor of competition, material gain, and business activity, that Machiavelli favors worldly gain, worldly comfort, the translation of thought into action in this world. Rothbard's conclusion is that the more I read Stroh's attack, the more I concluded that Machiavelli had more good points in his philosophy than I had imagined. Rothbard asked himself, must Stroh's push me into being a Machiavellian? <laughs> Rothbard admires Machiavelli for being a, a humanist and for having placed the human being at the center of the universe. Concerning the Straussian conception of natural rights, Rothbard questioned the thesis that identified the modern theory of natural rights as a break with the past. He placed more emphasis on continuity with the past rather than a sharp division. According to the continuity thesis, individual natural rights derive from natural law. Rothbard underlined the scholastic, Thomist and Christian roots of the Lockean doctrine of modern rights. But within this continuity, he found in the individualism of the modern natural rights, a development and an enrichment in respect of the past, the beginning of, of a new way of understanding the human being and the ends of politics. Thus, while Rothbard has appreciated the Straussian idea of natural law, as a battle against the prevailing relativism of values. On the other hand, he was unable to accept it at the point where Strauss invited his readers to reclaim the classic natural right doctrine in its original form, that if fully developed, is identical with the doctrine of the best regime. In supporting the theory that there was a link between Thomism and the Grotian development in the doctrine of natural law, Rothbard is close, among others, to the Italian philosopher Passarin Dantraev. Within this vision, the Rothbardian idea of a link between the laws of nature and natural rights became less distinct at the point where the author emphasized the enrichment brought by the levelers and Locke in terms of individualism. Rothbard said that while Aristotle's vision of man led to the state being seen as the place of the good and virtuous action, quote, it was in contrast the levelers and John Locke in 17th century England who transform classical natural law into a theory grounded on methodological and hence political individualism. The continuity thesis has recently been corroborated by the study of Brian Tierney, who clearly questioned the ideas of Strauss and Villay on the contrast between an ancient Aristotelian doctrine of natural law and the modern theory of subjective individual rights. Rothbard can be counted among those who, like Passarin Dontrev and Henry Vich, founded natural rights on the Aristotelian Thomist theory of natural law. However, Rothbard's position is original for two reasons. First, because from self-ownership, he deduced the action of non-aggression, the true cornerstone of the Rothbardian system, which he viewed as a clarification of the classic triad of the natural rights to life, liberty, and property. Second, because of the extreme consequences that Rothbard arrives at 
regarding natural law and the role of the state. In fact, Rothbard wanted to establish an objective ethics which affirms the overriding value of liberty and morally condemns all forms of statism. While the starting points for Rothbard and Passarin d'Entraire were very similar, the two authors differ profoundly as regards the concept of the common good and the role of the state. Passarin d'Entraire thought that the state should be an instrument, the, institu the institutional framework by means of which all the rights to life, freedom, and ownership could be guaranteed. The theme of the rational foundation of ethics and absolute values became preponderant in the comments on the Symposium on Relativism organized by the Volcker Fund. The conference held in 1960 witnessed a contrast between Mises and Bruno Leone on one side and Leo Strauss on the other. In this case, Rothbard sided with Strauss. From the time of his prefatory note, Rothbard made it clear he was in favor of absolute values. He wrote that the absolutist believes that man's mind employing reason is capable of discovering and knowing truth, including the truth about reality and the truth about what is best for himself as an individual. The relativist denies this, denies that man's reason is capable of knowing truth and does so by claiming that rather than being absolute, truth is relative to something else. Philosophically, I believe that libertarianism and the wider creed of sound individualism of which libertarianism is a part must rest on absolutism and deny relativism. This is, a, is the position of Rothbard. And this represented a clear and apparently definitive division within the Austrian School of Economics. With Hayek and the Hayekians on one side, and many of the American disciples of the school leaded by Rothbard on the other. The concept of natural law was in some ways extraneous to the origin of the Austrian School of Economics, which favored an evolutionary conception of institutions and law following the approach of Menger and later Hayek. In this sense, we can say that the concept of natural law has been an enrichment introduced in the Austrian school by the American libertarian tradition of thought. The criticism of Mises was paradigmatic of this division. Rothbard distanced himself from the praxeological and value-free defense of the free market Mises proposed in support of the opportunity and need for political philosophy to find universally valid basic values. Mises based his own liberalism on the, subjectiv on the subjectivity of values and ends. But for Rothbard, this made Mises an ethical relativist. Quote, Mises' utilitarian relativist approach <coughs> to ethics is not nearly enough to establish a full case for liberty. It must be supplemented by an absolutist ethics, an ethics of liberty. Failure to recognize this is the greatest flaw in Mises' political worldview. The subjectivity of values and ends was the nodal point in Mise of Misesian thought and the basis of an open society. Mises followed human assumptions that it was impossible to derive values from facts. For Mises, value judgments merely express preferences of a subjective nature that can't be considered neither true nor <coughs> false. Rothbard disagrees with this view of ethics. A problem with it 
is how to convince others that the best social system is the market appealing only to subjective values. <coughs> Beside this, in Rothbard's opinion, there are self-evident truths able to provide a basis for an, uh, for an objective ethic. The ownership of oneself, of one's own body, would be an example of such a truth. Mises rejects this position, and according to his way of thinking, criteria for objectively evaluating value judgment did not exist. According to Mises, no man is qualified to declare what would make another man happier or less discontented. Given his ethical subjectivism, Mises rejects the entire notion, no, notion of natural law. Quote, the teachings of utilitarian philosophy and classical economics have nothing at all to do with the doctrine of natural right. They recommend popular government, private property, tolerance, and freedom, not because they are natural or just, but because they are beneficial. In brief, Mises' reasoning did not satisfy the Rothbardian requirement of establishing an objective and rational basis for liberty. Rothbard also reproached Bruno Leone regarding ethical relativism because the latter is scornful of the very idea that ethical values should be rationally demonstrated. Again, when reviewing Freedom and the Law by Leone, Rothbard criticized Leone's theory because it lacked a standard on which to judge the content of laws that had evolved over time. It was not enough to affirm the existence of a spontaneous process from which customs and institutions de developed. It was necessary to subject them to the strict test of reason in order to judge their conformity with individual freedom on the basis of an objective ethical standard. Rothbard criticism of Hayek's formulation, both evolutionist and fallibilist, is closely connected to the discussion of natural law. The fact that Hayekian and Rothbardian premises were irreconcilable emerge in the two reviews of Constitution of Liberty. <clears throat> to explain the reasons for liberty, Hayek starts from evolutionary and fallibilist positions that were in contrast with the doctrine of natural law and rationalism, the latter being the premises for Rothbard's anarcho-capitalist theory. In Rothbard's opinion, one of the shortcomings of Hayek's work was that he totally ignored the tradition of natural law, even when discussing theorists who were actually great supporters of the doctrine of natural law, as in case of John Locke. Hayek seemed not to have been aware of a great tradition of thought, natural law, that had played a very important role in the growth of liberal ideas and in limiting the powers of the state. This subject is more complex than first appears. We have to bear in mind that Hayek used evolutionary premises as a starting point for his thinking about the rule of law and the law in general. He represented one of the greatest expressions of the tradition of spontaneous order, developed by Adam Smith and Adam Ferguson in the Scottish Enlightenment, and which continued by Edmund Burke, led to von Savigny, Maine, Menger, and to the Austrian School of Economics. In Hayek's work, the fundamental concept was that of cultural evolution, which, which had to do with the origin and development of institutions such as, among others, religion, law, the market, and so on. 
But following the ideas of Charles Covell and of the Italian philosopher Nicola Matteucci, it is possible to conceive an Hayekian position not in direct contrast with the concept of natural law, understood in terms of cultural evolution. Matteucci underlined the fact that for Edward Koch and the other English jurists, there was no contrast between natural law and common law, because the latter was simply the implementation of the natural law principles from which it, it had developed historically over the centuries. It was in this sense that Edward Koch was able to write that the common law expressed the perfection of reason. In a customary constitution, reason was imminent, but not the absurd reason of the rationalist, rather an historically developed reason. That's why in the English legal and political tradition, there was less of a rigid contrast between nature and history. In this view, even John Locke's great work on natural law essentially spoke of a tradition that became rationalized and universal. <coughs> <clears throat> the truly irreconcilable points between the evolutionist theory of law and Rothbard's concept of natural law were <coughs> rationalism and fallibilism. One of Rothbard's criticism was, in fact, Hayek's continuous and all-pervasive attack on reason. The faith in the rational capacities of man to discover and correctly to interpret the laws of nature and absolute ethical values was not really compatible with the evolutionist and fallibilist position. The foundation of liberty were completely different for Hayek and Rothbard. Hayek based the reason for liberty on our ignorance and fallibility. For Rothbard, on the other hand, human ignorance was too uncertain a basis for liberty. According to the authentic rationalist theory, we should be able to know what is best for man and to found absolute values on human nature. Rothbard dismissed the Ayakian premises as an attack on man's reason. It seems to me that on this point, Rothbard's position is going to originate an interesting debate. The proposed anchoring of absolute values on an eternal and unchanging kind of human nature can be object of discussion, of course. Thus, the attempt to establish what is, what is absolutely good for man by appealing to human nature demonstrated the great distance between Rothbard and Hayek's evolutionary argument. In this sense, Rothbard's criticism of Hayek is paradigmatic of the split we find today within the horizons of the Ocean School of Economics between the libertarians who refer back to Locke's version of the idea of right reason that enables an understanding of natural law, and the heirs of the theory, typical of the origins of the Ocean School, of a limited, fallible, and evolutionist kind of knowledge. This contrast, already evident in the writings under consideration here, was made explicit by Rothbard in 1992 in the article, The Present State of the Austrian School of Economics, from which the profound differences between the various paradigms within the Austrian School emerge. In this paper, Rothbard took his distance from Hayek's entire work, in that it was devoted to a denigration of human reason. Moreover, Rothbard did highlight one of the more problematic areas of Hayek's work. He rightly pointed out that not all that had evolved spontaneously was consistent with a system of liberty. It would therefore be a mistake to accept all conventions and customs 
for the simple reason that they had already been established. To finish, I'm going to say something about Rothbard and Karl Polanyi. Reviewing Polanyi, Great Transformation, Rothbard points out that the philosophic flow in Polanyi is a common defect which has been rampant since Rousseau, the worship of the primitive. It is assumed that the way of living of the primitive is more natural and more appropriate to man than the artifices of civilization. Rothbard recalls to Polanyi that the progress of man and his victory over famines and disease is due to his capacity to alter the environment by the use of reason, by capitalism, and by the market. He remarks that the life of the savage, as Hobbes put it, is nasty, brutish, and short. According to Polanyi, the great, trans the great transformation was the degeneration in the sense of authoritarianism of the liberal institutions. He denied the liberal idea according to which a market society was a natural historical outcome. And therefore, he tried to demonstrate the pathological nature of the liberal market. As a result, Polanyi criticized the classical economic school and the free market. The free market, in Polanyi's opinion, could only produce a dangerous individualism and social disaggregation. On the contrary, society, in order to defend itself, has to regulate the market. As Rothbard notes, in all of his complaining about the free market, Polanyi doesn't mention perhaps the most important aspect of the system, freedom. In a free society, no one compels Polanyi or anyone else to enter the free market. But one thing, and one thing alone, the free society <clears throat> would not permit Polanyi to do, to use coercion over the rest of us. Rothbard observes that there is no better way of refuting Polanyi's weeping about the lost glories of society than to observe the numberless millions who have chosen the way of the market when, the, when they had the free of choice. No, it's not mine. <laughs> In fact, it is precisely such left-wing intellectuals as Polanyi who are always weeping about the coca cola of the rest of the world. But given a choice, almost everyone chooses the market economy and its advanced civilization, even, curiously enough, Professor Polanyi himself, who did not rush off to some tribe or commune. In all the papers I have discussed, a constant theme has emerged. Rothbard always defends individual freedom, understood in a libertarian way, as including the right to own property. The individual rights that form the basis of anarcho-capitalism can, he holds, be rationally defended as requirements of human nature. Leo Strauss is thus correct to defend the idea of natural law, but in error in thinking that Locke's defense of liberty and property broke with natural law. Mises rightly defends the free market, but mistakenly does so with the subjectivist and relativist ethics. Hayek wrongly substitutes cultural evolution for a rationally deduced natural law, and Polanyi an enemy of the free market fails to see that the market is a natural result of human action, not an imposition by government. Rothbard's defense of freedom represents an important option in political philosophy. And we can safely predict that future political philosophy 
will have to come to terms with Rothbard, since he touches some vital points within the political philosophical debate, such as the possibility of a rational foundation of ethical absolute values, a controversial point on which political philosophers and philosophers in general are still divided and are still discussing, and I'm sure they will discuss for a long, long time. Thank you. We have time for questions, uh, and David Gordon will assist in repeating those questions. <coughs> oh, it, if it's not necessary, I mean, we just wanted to repeat. The mm -hmm. Okay. We're there. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, presentation and a very clear exposition of the like net modernist uh, element of Strauss, the anti-rationalist dimension of Hayek, and the uh, market uh, element of uh, Gandhi. I have a question for you, and the answer may be very simple. I don't know, or I don't care. So it's this, uh, Eric Ferguson was the member of the Mises seminar, mm -hmm. uh, and so on, and after his flight Strauss came to the United States, and he settled in the I can't remember it, or Louisiana, and so on. Was, has written you know, uh, substantially and so on. Is there, is there any element of confidence or dissonance between the work, uh, say, since they're both descended, as it were, to mm -hmm. some in some respect, do they have any contact, overlap, uh, controversy at all? Oh, I must confess. Oh, uh, yeah. the, oh. uh, the question is did Eric Vogelin, who was one of Mises' students, have any contact with Murray Rothbard? I must confess I don't know uh, the uh, work of Henry Vogelin. Um, I think he's closer to Strauss' position than uh, to Rothbard one, because he's much more conservative. So I, I could just add that uh, Rothbard uh, didn't wrote on Vogelin, he thought he, he really couldn't understand what Vogelin's thought was all about. He, 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 uh, he attended lectures by Vogelin, but he, he really didn't think much of him. Uh, uh, he couldn't understand what he was saying. Mm -hmm. Over oh, there, Dave. Oh, yes? Can you give some more specific examples of relativism by Mises? Uh, the question is to give specific examples, examples by, of, uh, of relativism by Mises and Hayek. Uh, they, they can be considered relativ relativists because they, both of them, they don't believe in the possibility of a rational foundation of absolute values, of absolute ethical values. In this sense, they can be considered relativists. Uh, because Hayek um, is convinced that values are relative to history. Um, they originated by uh, a natural process of evolution through history over the centuries. So uh, he has an historical conception of values. So in, in this sense, he can't be considered an absolutist uh, values. And Mises too, I mean, Mises doesn't believe in a rational foundation of values. Um, his theory is a, a subjectivist theory of, of values. He founded uh, his conception of liberty on the subjectivity of values. So in this sense, if you want, you can consider them relativists. Of course, they are not absolutists. Mm -hmm. 
Murray Rothbard did not have a successful academic career. Mm -hmm. For many years, he worked in Brooklyn Polytech. His yeah. nice job was in a better school in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Suppose Murray Rothbard was recycled. Like the way the Indian, uh, some philosophers say you could be born again or something like that. Mm -hmm. Suppose there was a Murray <coughs> Rothbard here who is now 22 years old and got a PhD. Uh -huh. Do you think he would have a more successful career than... The first Murray Rothbard. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, supposing Murray Rothbard re reborn uh, would have been a more successful career than the one he, uh, unfortunately, uh, the one he had. Maybe yes, maybe yes. Mm. First, because there is a, a sort of revival of the Austrian School of Economics, uh, uh, there is a lot of interest uh, about the Austrian School of Economics. Uh, I mean, uh, there are people all over the world who um, are involved in the Austrian School of Economics in Italy, in Germany, in France, not only in the United States. So maybe yes. And after, after that, there is also um, a sort of political philosophy, uh, political philosophy revival. I mean, there is a lot of discussion, there is a lot of debate today about the foundation of values. Uh, in today, uh, we we are trying to defend the Western uh, Judeo-Christian tradition against uh, the attacks from other kind of cultures. So uh, we need political philosophy. So uh, the, contribution, the contribution of Rothbard maybe would have been more appreciated. I answered the question? OK. Uh, does it, doesn't any form of relativism have to be rejected, seeing that it's self-refuting? Because relativism is making a claim that it itself is absolutely correct, which therefore refutes the I didn't understand uh, him. The question is, isn't uh, relativism self-refuting because it's making the claim, it says that uh, ethical judgments are relative, but it itself is claiming to be an absolute statement. Because it's unethical. It's not uh, a statement about ethics. Uh, it's, it's not self-refuting. It's not. I don't, no, I don't think it's self-refuting uh, because it makes uh, ethical statements, but not. It's not self-refuting. But if, if relativism claims that there's no absolute truth, that it then mm -hmm. that it says that it itself is absolutely always mm -hmm. applied and is always true. No, I, I don't think no, I don't think so. I don't think that relativism is self-refuting for this reason. I mean, just and you see, you have to distinguish between ethical relativism. What you, your your objection might apply to the view that all truth is relative, but ethical relativism wouldn't be claiming that; it would only be claiming that ethical truths are relative. And it's perfectly consistent to say that's absolutely true. Wouldn't Hayek say, uh, oh, come on, I'm not against reason, I'm just against, say, the, um, you mm -hmm. know, exalted... The abuse of reason. The exalted, uh, yeah, the abuse of reason, for example, the idea that we can plan an economy, which Rothbard mm -hmm. himself would acknowledge mm -hmm. uh, reason yes. cannot do. Yes. But what, what would be Rothbard's yes. response to that? Uh, uh, the question is that Hayek said that he wasn't against reason, but he was against the abuse of reason and the use of reason for planning everything, for planning economy, uh, is, is a position shared by Rothbard. So what? What you want to so say? What would Rothbard say? Rothbard ah, Hayek is against reason. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, Rothbard maintains that Hayek is against reason, but specifically because Hayek is against um, 
the rational foundation of values. I mean, uh, uh, he doesn't uh, he doesn't agree with the implication of natural law um, of the rational foundation of values. But of course, they shared some common ideas. I mean, uh, they were both uh, Austrian economists. Uh, so uh, Rothbard uh, was against. Uh, economic planning and Hayek, uh, and so was Hayek, uh, maybe uh, the bases uh, were different. I mean, the basis um, for refuting uh, economic planning were different from Rothbard and Hayek, because Hayek refuted um, the idea of the possibility of planning uh, economy, of planning institutions, because he believes in fallibilism. Mm? Uh, on the other side, uh, Rothbard believes the same thing, but he based um, his theory of liberty um, on on natural on natural rights, on absolute values. So uh, the bases for liberty were different. But the outcome was very similar in some topics, of course. Not about, uh, not in the field of the role of the state, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, sir? Uh, what's the what's the question? I mean, uh, I I I understand that uh, you you Would think. Be useful in order to resolve the debate between uh -huh. Rothbard and Strauss to go back to the original thinkers that they seem to represent mm -hmm. uh, and examine their their yeah, the arguments they put forward. Yes, I mean, maybe it's simplistic. Just it's, sim it's too simple. Uh, just to say Rothbard was a Lockean, uh, Hayek uh, was uh, a Humean, um, and so on. I mean, uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't want to say exactly this, but of course it's useful to examine the various authors uh, to, which they re uh, to whom they related, of course. Mm -hmm. It's a work uh, I have done. Mm -hmm. uh, the lady. Whose work right now, who is living as a historian, a philosopher, an economist, is, in your view, the most Rothbardian? <laughs> it is difficult to say. Maybe uh, uh, oh, the lady asked uh, who um, who is the most uh, Rothbardian um, economist, political philosophers uh, who is uh, living and working today. Uh, maybe Hans Hermann Hoppe. Maybe Hans Hermann Hoppe. Maybe uh, he's uh, at least he considers himself the direct heir of Rothbard. I don't, I don't know if Rothbard would have been happy, but <laughs> <laughs> this is the way he considers himself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in Italy, we have, we have a scholar uh, who is very close to some Rothbardian position, uh, who is not very famous because he's still young, uh, who is Marco Bassani. Uh, he's very close to some Rothbardian position. I don't hear him. 
the question is, uh, if you wanted to learn about Rothbard's philosophy uh, sort of from a beginner's point of view, what would be the best book by Rothbard to uh, read? Maybe The Ethics of Liberty, yes. If you want to know uh, Robardian political philosophy, uh, maybe you have to read uh, The Ethics of Liberty uh, to um, approach Rothbard for the first time. It contains his political philosophy. Any other question? Yes, please. A more modest project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a uh, he told that uh, according to me it seems that Mises have a sort of more modest project uh, than Rothbard he stopped to the economic context, uh, he, he, he doesn't go further establishing a full case for liberty, maybe. Uh, but I don't think Mises had a, most, a more modest project. Uh, he believed that liberty uh, had to be uh, defended in a different way uh, from Rothbard. That's all. I mean, they had different uh, point of view. They believed in different kind of foundation of a free society. One more question. Mm -hmm. What is the maybe difference between Ayn Rand's defense of liberty and Rothbard's uh, uh, she asked the major, which is the major defense between Ayn Rand's, Ayn Rand's defense of liberty and Rothbard's defense of liberty. Uh, there are some similarities because uh, uh, Ayn Rand um, founded her defense of liberty on the Aristotelian, the, 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 the Thomist Aristotelian concept of natural law. But maybe Rothbard, I mean, maybe, cons maybe Rothbard construct a system. Not maybe. Rothbard did construct a system. Um, so um, there are some similarities, but Rothbard went further than Ayn Rand. And I'm not sure, I mean, mm, there. It seems that Rothbard mm, has been influenced by, by Ayn Rand, but it's not so sure. I mean, maybe mm, there are some scholars who are convinced that Rothbard already believed in natural law before meeting, um, meeting uh, Ayn Rand. And maybe it is so reading these, uh, uh, these papers because some of them are previous the meeting of between Rothbard and Ayn Rand. 